We're going to take a major gear change now. Uh, I'm conscious that we are behind schedule and apologies uh, to everybody out there that was uh, uh, suffering because of the technical issues. We were, we're doing our best and we will try and bring everything back on to uh, schedule and finish up at the uh, projected time of eight o'clock in terms of the presentations and a short half an hour at the end. So our next uh, speakers are two farmers who are members of the Danu Group. Uh, Coleman Dealey is an organic uh, dairy farmer from Strand in Limerick and Graeme Harris is an in-conversion organic cereals and livestock farmer from Kildare. Both are members of the Danu Farming Group uh, who are researching how to make biological farming work in Irish conditions based on sound understanding of soil structure, chemistry, biology and plant nutrition. Sean and the Danu technical advisor Robbie Ward went down to visit Coleman and Graeme earlier this week to discuss their ongoing trials and research. Danu received funding through the EU's EIP programme and the Department of Agriculture carry out a five-year bio biological farming transition programme. So, uh, please sit back and enjoy this session with the Danu members. You're very, very welcome to West Limerick and we're on the farm with Coleman Dealey here. Coleman Dealey is a recently c converted organic dairy farmer. So Coleman, I'm going to let you just tell us all about yourself yeah. and what you're doing. Yeah, thank you, Sean. Um, welcome to the farm and welcome to everybody in the watching Knots today at the Biofarm 2020. Coleman Dealey is my name. We're in Glen Quinn in West Limerick in the parish of Kiniri. Um As Sean said, I'm in organic conversion and will be fully organic on 1st of January. So obviously I'm a new newbie to organic agriculture and biological farming and biological practices have been a key, a key factor in helping me convert and in giving me the confidence to convert from organic to conventional agriculture. Why, why, why do you see it as, as an essential element? Um, to take a step backwards, I suppose 2018 in Ireland was uh, quite a, an extreme weather event year. We had a very, very, very bad winter and we had a very, very late spring and then we had a long, prolonged drought. And it, one of the things was there was very little space for or need on the farm for artificial fertiliser that year, which would have been the normal practice in that it was too wet to go out in the spring. and it was too dry in the summer to not much good out of it and that's uh, I have been interested in organic agriculture for a lot of years and but that was a key point in saying look <laughs> the grass is growing the cows are grazing I can do this without all these inputs um, but at the same time there's a transition needed and you're looking at how to help the farm convert and how to help to restore the health of the soil and I felt biological agriculture offered um, a, a way in, in, in helping the soil and in, in understanding the concepts to get my farm functioning properly without what had been conventional in, in fertiliser inputs mm -hmm. for the last 40, 50 years. So, and, and it's a bit of an unfair question in yeah. a way, I suppose, yeah. but you're, this is your, really your second year, is it? Or, it is, yeah. it is. So it's so my second year in conversion. Ha what changes have happened in that period? Yeah. Um, look, it's, it's, Dan Kittredge used the phrase, first do no harm, and, you know, from the Hippocratic Oath, and he, along with the rest of it, but John McHugh kind of in the, developed that a little bit when he, he talked about, you know, are you doing things that are setting your farm back? So the first thing we did was try to stop doing things that we believe were damaging our farm biologically, and in organic um, rules like you're not allowed to artifi apply artificial fertilizers, artificial herbicides, our herbicides. So, um, and that is the first step towards towards helping the soil rebuild and function biologically rather than function from completely dependent on artificial fertilizers. So, that would be the first change. The next change is obviously if you take out all these inputs that you've been using for 40, 50 years, you're going to have a drop. You're going to have a slump. You're going to have a drop in growth, and so we had to redu we reduce our stocking rate. We plan to reduce our stocking rate and to reduce our inputs. So, um, from a financial point of view, it, well, it isn't it isn't actually very damaging because really the margin between those inputs and your output isn't massive, and so it, it's not really a huge. It hasn't been because a huge you're, financial. You're now 
not as much chasing yield as reducing costs. Yes, that's yes. what I've been doing for the last two years. Yeah. And you're also doing so with the goal of improving your your the, your input price or your output prices, your value for your product, your sale prices when you get an organic to get an organic premium for it. So that's the carrot um, that you're aiming for. Um, I suppose the other way, what has changed is you change the way you look at the farm because you're not following a blueprint, you're not following somebody else's instructions. You're trying to follow what's happening. You're trying to you're trying to understand what's happening rather than just being told what's happening. So that, that there's a huge learning curve there for me over the last few years and in both information and also my own experience, experience managing it. Yeah, Alan Savory talks about the role of observation almost in science that is yeah. nearly gone, but also maybe in gone in farming as well to a point in terms of husbandry. Yeah, I mean, it's how I'd put it is, obviously if you're a farmer you have to observe, but it's reactionary observation rather than proactive observation. So your observation reacting things and going in with cures, going in with fixes, going in with remedies to, to deal with problems rather than observing and trying to develop what is happening and try to understand why it's happening and to understand that this is a power greater than you, that the power of nature is, as we all know, is much, we're part of it, but it's much greater than us. So we have to understand how to harness it and to use it and to, to live with it. So it, it's a different kind of observation. You're trying to figure things out um, as you and, 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 and apply the information knowledge you think to your own farm because each farm is different and each of the circumstances is slightly different so that's the key as well to apply it individually to your farm okay yeah. and another thing i suppose that because biofarm we talk an awful lot about the soil yeah is is there changes coming to the soil in the short period of time or do you see that as a much more longer term yes obviously it's longer term in one way but for instance here in the field we're standing now this would have field i would have experimented with before in say before I decided to go fully organic. So say in 2018, this field got no artificial fertilizer or any artificial inputs at all. So it's basically been in conversion a year longer. Okay. And I would have seen a drop, a drop in production, especially last year in, there's a few fields around here, there's 15 acres that I've done this with around here. And I would have seen a drop of production there significant last year. And I was wondering, you know, this isn't looking good like, you know, this is, these fields aren't doing well. In this field you're talking about yeah, now, yeah. Yeah, in this field as well. This field, um, as an example, of where the rest of the farm is going much better. Whereas this field has completely bounced back this year to be one of the better performing fields in the farm. And it's given me great hope. And the other thing that you might see around the place is actual, the sward composition has diversified. This would have been a ryegrass sward. So now it's an old reseed, but it still would have been predominantly ryegrass. And there's other grasses creeping in. Um, some of the, say, in conventional model, less favourable grasses, weed grasses, you'd be told. Um, but I find, in the absence of artificial fertiliser and high nitrogen rates, they're actually functioning very well. And they're given, and, and it's helping the sward. And if I, if I dig a hole here, I'll give an example. Before here, this is, to give in context, <laughs> by the time you see this, this is last week. And we're after a very prolonged period of heavy rains, both recently and over the last two weeks. So soils kind of are, are heavy and wet, stock or hosed, because look, as I say, we're in a high rainfall area, we're well over the metre of rain. Um, and what I want to show you is down here, if I was to dig this two, three years ago, the top three inches would have broken off there and I'd be left with this. And, I'd, and then I would dig again and below it would be drier. And that has changed. The root and depth has increased. It has gone down a couple of inches forward and there'll also be significant glaying. And for those of you who are unfamiliar, glaying is where water is coming up and down through the soil and draining the soil. You see rusty patches and we have a lot of iron in the soil. You'll still see a little bit of iron, but what you get is you get the much crummier structure you're getting see those roots coming down there yes they're greater than four inches they're just from ordinary grass mm. that hasn't been holistically grazed they're growing down further the roots are growing down further the grayness has gone out of the soil and the 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 the, the link between the top soil the very surface and the six inches down has improved significantly okay coleman uh what are we looking at here now well you're standing in the middle of a trial plot and the trial plot is being run through the Danu group, 
which is an EIP group which I'm very fortunate to be part of. Um, this trial plot is looking to explore transitioning away from high input conventional farming towards more biological farming. Um, what we have here in this trial plot, the, the trial plot is four hectares within this field, this is a six hectare field, and what we have here is we have four sections running from top to bottom. They're virtual sections because they're marked at each end, you can see them here, and there's different treatments in each, and different management in each section, and we're comparing the results of that over five years. So as part of this trial plot, in the middle section, roughly two and a half hectares, we put in a multi-species sward which I'm standing in. So the, the top section running horizontally across the field would have been um, an attempt made to stitch in multi-species sward. There's another section above, there's a line there, you can see uh, a distinct line where it was disted in and distilled and seeded and this side was conventionally ploughed and reseeded. So there's pluses and minuses to both to all of them, um, which I can briefly go through. The stitching didn't really establish because it's just, I've seen it before, there's too much competition from the existing sward, even if they're in, it germinates well, but it just cannot outcompete it eventually. The disking worked slightly better and the ploughing had very, very good establishment, but you have issues from the ploughing where for some bizarre reason, and it never happened before, where rushes have started to appear on relatively high dry ground there that had never appeared in before. It must have been something to do with the way the way it was cultivated or whatever we did wrong. We, we, we overdid you something. Or under the the, bank, but. Yeah, but at the same time, this field was plow, has been ploughed 20 years ago and never a rush appeared in it and there was never a rush. So we'll get rid of them, but it's just, again, you'll be learning. The other thing you'd see if you look at the ground here today, again, there's quite a lot of surface water. And again, it's a clay soil and when you plough it, it was only ploughed about five inches, but it takes time for the soil structure to re-establish and for the water infiltration to improve as well. So we'd be hoping the multi-species ward will develop that over time with their, ex with their extra rooting development. Um, but again, that's part of what we'll find over five years. The, the new programme, to talk about it, there's four plots. Plot one at the far side over to plot four, just where we're kind of standing between three and four. And plot one is a control plot where it's just standard recommendations. So um, the P and K levels and the lime levels and the pH is maintained to standard um, practices. The plot two is the addition of a carbon source. So that has got both mol uh, molasses sprayed out in water through, at intervals through the year. And it also got biochar in, in, in slurry um, just once. And at a pretty low rate because we hadn't much biochar available. Plot three and four is the same, is plus two, plot two plus. Plot three and four get trace element balancing. So this field was soil sample in detail and would have, trace elements were found to be low on it, especially boron, but also cobalt, zinc. And um, so we're looking at bringing up those levels over time. So that gets a biannual dose of trace elements. And plot four gets biological sprays as well. To, along with that to try and boost the biological activity. So that would kind of be an example of that would be seaweed extract, it would be compost tea extract, it could be something like milk, it could be any anything else you, they're the simple things that we've used. You, um, I haven't gone down the road of ferment, fermenting products or anything. Um, and again, this it really is its first, 2020 was its first full year of treatment, 2019 was, established only in mid-season so it hadn't got much treatments it got no it only got treatments in the fall of 2019 and so 2020 is its first few full year of treatments and we're only start seeing initial results yet but it's very early days okay okay so to look at this again next year and i would be yeah we're hoping you're going to see some results yeah you would and to Ken is back to observation it's like it's not that there's a right and wrong i mean with a multi-species ward you'd be hoping even the control plot should yield considerable improvements because we have the comparison with the standard rye grass or grass sward above and below it mm -hmm. so we can compare that um what we have seen is it at times and not all the time but it has been a pattern nonetheless is an increase in bricks readings across the plots from one to four so at times it would have gone from maybe five in plot one up to eights nines and tens in plot four through sixes and sevens. It has improved across, and at other times it would be flat the same across it. So again, 
uh, we're measuring things, we're watching things, and we're only we're, we're recording the data. Um, but w one other thing we noticed was where I applied the biological sprays initially, they graze much more aggressively. But then there's the carry on of that. Well, that limits the recovery of that plot. So to a longer recover period. Is yeah. It? So it's been grazed together. So in a way. It's a plus in one way and another way then because of it's been all being managed together. It meant that that section was at a lower cover level for the nearly the remainder of the grazing season because every time they came in, they grazed it more aggressively, slightly more aggressively and it took longer to come back and it kind of, it almost defeated what I was trying to do and I am not set up yet. I mean, like he was grazed at 26, 28 day rotations roughly throughout the year, maybe 30 towards the end, but really, that was lovely high covers in the, in the summer, but at the back end, then the growth rates really dropped in, in, in September. We were after wet August, and it was grazed a low cover, and there's actually a very low cover in it now. But I'm not too worried about that either, because, again, we're trying to balance things. If I want to retain my clover, and there's very high clover levels in this field over the winter, I can't really carry a heavy cover over the winter. So we're, we're feeling our way, really, yes. Sean, and it is early days. But the multi-species story, I have it in a few other plots as well now and it's all positive so far. It's positive in terms of palatability, production, the cows go up about a litre every time they come in here. Um, in the early part of the year, the protein increased by about 0.1 as well, but in the later part, it, that changed, that, that, that gap wasn't as, as, as uh, um, apparent. Um, it's soil traffic ability isn't an issue. Um, so persistence, but again, if it persists for three or four years, if it dies out then, I'm still left with a grass clover sward. So it will have done some good and done me a lot of good in the meantime. So it's a positive story so far, but again. And if you didn't ago. want to, we'll say for example, go back to, to, to ploughing, is, uh, is it possible to extend that multi-species sward beyond that four or five year mark? Yeah, I, again, um, they're probably in places that's down where longer and that's there's a few things we'll have to look at there there's the management and there's also if we can come up a way of maybe stitching that's successful we can also look then at what as in the previous field we were in what will re-establish naturally so we'll because my management system has changed both in terms of inputs and maybe then in also grazing higher covers and leaving a higher residual will 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 the sort structure change as well will a different level of species come back into it, um, you would hope so, and that would be an aim. I mean, like, we're not in a place where we winter graze here or where, you know, we're, we're, we're not going to be out, out wintering and spreading bales of from, from high diversity plots onto it, really. So I don't see that as a method of, of, of diversification. But yet, at the same time, you'd be hoping that the, that the diversity will actually only improve over time, even if it means just a regeneration of native species. Okay, great. Yeah. Well, thanks very much, Coleman. Yeah. And we look forward to, I'm sure, we'll have Q&As that you'll be online for on, uh, yeah. is it Monday you're on? It is Monday, Monday evening I'm yeah. on, yeah. Yes. Monday evening I'm on, yeah. Perfect. Great stuff. Thanks, thanks. again. Thanks, Sean. Hello everyone, uh, we're here today as part of Biofarm uh, Conference 2020 on the farm of Graham Harris in County Kildare. So Graham's just going to give us a little insight into how he started on his road to biological agriculture and biological farming. So I'll ask uh, right. Graham to introduce himself on the farm. All right, thanks Robbie. Yeah, uh, my name's Graham. Um, I'm here on my, my family farm that uh, I grew up on. Um, I've been on it all my life, That's uh, working on it as a young fella and now I run it in my own right. Um, I took over the farm in 2003 after my father passed away. Um, it was primarily uh, beef, sheep and tillage when I, I took it over. Um, a conventional agriculture farm. We uh, we started in with the, with the cattle, sheep and tillage and I decided to go in to specialise in cereals and sheep. Uh, I, I went away from the cattle then after a year or two. So I, I continued in conventional agriculture for about 10 years. I was quite focused on yields and getting them higher and get growing kind of better, more more crops, more plentiful crops. And uh, 
that went on for, for a good while. The farm was going well, yields were going up, but uh, I started looking into things a bit more. When I started looking into what was going on below the soil, um, I decided there was a different way that I wanted to go. It, it was very, um, it was very yield driven before and I, I just thought it wasn't sustainable. We were taking huge off cuts from the farm and I reckoned it wasn't sustainable in the long term and that some of the things I was doing I wasn't happy with as well. Insecticides and herbicides and stuff like that wasn't sitting, sitting as well with me. After doing uh, the soils course and attending some conferences, um, I decided I wanted to go down a different route. So around that time, we uh, the organic scheme opened up again and uh, I decided to go uh, go into organics. Uh, it would, was a good fit for me. It was going to help me go down the, the road I wanted to go down and, and change my farming system. Um, a bit before that, I'd been approached by uh, Danu. It was a, an EIP. So uh, it was a great opportunity for me to upskill as well, because I suppose I didn't, uh, I had an idea what I wanted to do, but I didn't have the, the necessary skills. So when Danu approached me, I, um, I jumped at the chance to get involved and uh, it meant that I was able to interact with other farmers that were on the same journey as me and wanting to change their farming systems to do a bit of research and find out a bit about uh, how we could improve the farms biologically and how we could, uh, I suppose, financially make it work. Um, we had uh, a couple of uh, great le leaders in the group, like we have uh, Robbie, who's a technical advisor, uh, David Wallace, uh, John McHugh, and it was just a, it was a great, great opportunity to get involved with good people. So uh, it was something I jumped at. So we, uh, we've been looking into um, going, uh, increasing soil biology. I suppose that when I was looking at agriculture before, I was very focused on what was above the ground. Um, we needed to start looking more below ground and see what was going on. Um, when I looked above ground, you could see that there was problems, but when you look below ground, you can sort of see what causes the problems and you can kind of chase it up. Like we, um, we went in doing earthworm counts, um, soil vest analysis and stuff like that. It was stuff that was all foreign to me before and getting involved with, with, a, with a group that led you down the right path and helped you understand some of the stuff that you were, you were doing research on. So. Um, was, uh, that was how it all started, I suppose. So, yeah, you, you might tell us a little bit about some of the changes to cropping history since you've sort of transitioned to organic and, and tied in the biological farming processes, Graham. Um, well, we were trying to go, there's a lot of talk about cover crops. So we're working in an Irish uh, environment and I was getting mixed successes with cover crops. Sometimes they were very successful. Other years, then you'd, you'd end up with nothing. So you were spending a lot of money on seed. You weren't really getting a return in the soil. Um, it wasn't doing much for you and it was this up down, you never knew what you were going to get out of it. So we, we were decided to try something in the rotation that would improve the, uh, the soil health in the summer's growing season. So looking at combi crops, so combi crops was a good one because that meant I could get an extra few plants in the field. So we were growing, um, looking into growing peas and barley together, um, which would give me um, a bit of a nitrogen fix off the pea. The two of them would grow together, 60-40 mix, uh, cereal to uh, pulse. Um, it meant that the pea would be easier to harvest as well, because sometimes harvesting can be difficult. So a nice easy uh, into growing a pulse or growing a, a protein crop. Um, then because I'd gone organic, I was able to um, add in um, a bit of the sunflowers and linseed into the mix. So I was able to grow a few different plants in the same field without affecting the agronomy too much. Um, Adding in sunflowers and linseed to the mix, um, both highly mycorrhizal, both from different plant families. So you're building up something that would uh, do a job for you on your soil biology. Um, so adding into that then again, all the time you're looking to try and build your plants in the field. Um, when I stopped spraying herbicide, inevitably some plants are going to turn up. So I ended up with a smattering of weeds uh, and some clover as well in the mix. So None of the weeds really went into anything that was a, a problem. Um, so I would have said they, they added to it, like we're probably too obsessed with clean fields, too used to wiping everything out and having to, um, you know, uh, just feel like we, we have to be in control the whole time. So it's not no problem for me if there's something growing in the field that's uh, not causing a problem, as long as it's not dominant. If you have a weed that turns up and it's dominant in the field or uh, creating a harvesting problem or a yield problem, then you have to go and sort it out. But if it's not causing a problem, I have no, I have no issue with it being there. So I suppose that 
that was what we, we looked at with the with the protein crop. Um, the other thing as well is that we're importing a lot of feeds, a lot of protein feeds getting imported. So growing an uh, Irish grown protein feed, very useful to a, a farmer here. Uh, it's good farmer to farmer interaction. It doesn't need to go anywhere. It can go straight from farm to farm, uh, providing a highly balanced, uh, well, well balanced feed for, for animals like so. And it fits in well with my, my rotation then. And you've spoken, Graham, about inter yeah, you had sheep on the farm and you've mentioned a few times to us in, in, in discussions about integrating that flock and using it more to, yeah. to help even, you know, the whole area of biodiversity. So you spoke about biodiversity mm. of plants yeah. and now you're also speaking about biodiversity of ways to control weeds and, yeah. and keep grass down. So if you'd speak a wee bit of... Well, that. I suppose with the sheep running uh, on the tillage system, it gives me a chance to go into fertility building lays. I wouldn't like to necessarily have the idea of um, sowing something that I'm not going to utilise. So... Um, by having a fertility building lay in place and utilizing it with the sheep, you're making it pay while you're building your fertility up, you're making it pay and then you're building up your soil, charging it up and go back into your uh, cash crops and they, they fit in nicely with that. So so getting as much diversity in the soil, building soil health, um, you just have to have a, a holistic approach to your soil management, I suppose. You know, you can't, no one thing is going to change it or improve it. You have to uh, look at it as a whole. And I think uh, one of the, one of the, aims of the Danu project has been to get empower farmers to maybe you know take on some more management themselves and feel that they're in maybe more in control of their farming systems and you seem to be you know a strong advocate for that yourself are you finding since you've moved firstly to organic and and then i suppose tying in a bit of biological element to that yeah. do you find that it's it's more of a management it's an enjoyable management yeah. challenge in, in my view but how do you find it or how have you envisioned it I suppose when you move to organics and you start looking at your biologicals a bit more, like there's no necessarily uh, uh, kind of say direct path, like you have to kind of find your own way. And it does, does need a bit of uh, responsibility taken on by the farmer to go to conferences, do a bit of reading, but no one's going to hand you the, the answer. You have to go out and find the answer for yourself and find what fits to your farm, because every farm's different, especially in Ireland. We were um, very lucky to have uh, Knots running these uh, biofarm courses like it's amazing to get so many people in the one place. Um, it certainly was something that like, I would have never been exposed to a lot of these speakers if I hadn't have gone to the conferences. Like, and it's a massive, uh, massive help to me. Get you thinking about things and, you know, it's real, uh, just, there's not that much out there. It's only just starting to grow. And now it is starting to grow with things like this. And it's a big help to farmers um, to have that resource there. And um, I suppose over the next few seasons, next few years, where do you see yourself with your organic, the whole systems approach to this farm? Now? Where would you like to be with it in the next few years? Improving soil the whole time, everything driven by soil, soil health. Um, everything has to come from the soil. Once you improve that, everything will come. Like a, we did earthworm counts when we went in uh, the, the Danu trials and it wasn't great. Like, you know, you were getting two worms in some uh, spade holes and five in another. Uh, we went up there digging this morning and I see a lot of earthworms so I'm excited about going back and doing my earthworm counts again because I think I've improved things. Um, so earthworms being a sign of soil health, they'll be a fair indicator like, yeah. you know. Um, I think that's, uh, it's, it has to be around that approach of, of building soil up. If I get healthier soil, I have healthier plants and it'll be easier to grow healthier plants because the soil will be uh, in, the, in the right uh, frame to, to make that happen. So, so that's... Uh, that's the main focus. You might just touch um, a little bit on, because I know you, you practice the biodynamics as, as well, and it's an, a very interesting subject and something we find the people who, who, who work with biodynamics are very enthusiastic about, and, and yet I find them very happy, mm. you know, and they seem, they seem to see the farm as, 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 a, as, a, as a pleasurable experience, a pleasure farming experience. So if you could maybe give us a few, you, you know, give us your experience of, of starting with biodynamics or <coughs> using them. And I suppose I'm quite lucky. My brother's uh, gone down that road before me. So he's gone and done a bit of research and he's bought a few machines to, to do his biodynamic spray and preps and stuff like that. So definitely drawing on his uh, experience and it's a, uh, it's probably an easy step in for me to start it, but I definitely see it as something I'm going to, I want to learn a lot more about. And it's something that I'd say farmers will get more interested in. I think there's a bit of power in it. Uh, it's hard to figure out. It won't be necessarily simple. Um, there's a, there's a lot, of, lot to it and a lot of figuring out, but uh, I think it has that kind of feel to it that it's uh, very in tune with nature, which is what I want to do. Like I, I felt I was at odds with nature before the whole time. I was trying to kill everything. Whereas everything I do now is trying to encourage nature. So I think that's, 
that's the difference. And when you go looking at something like biodynamics, it's all about life, life processes. So I think it's a, it's an encouraging and uh, enjoyable thing to get involved in. So yeah, no oh, super. That's the that's yeah. that's a, a real a real good explanation of it. Hello everyone, uh, we're here today as part of Biofarm uh Okay, ladies and gentlemen, you're welcome back to Carrick on Shannon, where we're streaming to you live. And I'm joined now by uh, both Graham Harris and Coleman Dealey. Can you hear me, lads? Yep. yep. The wonders of modern technology. It's wonderful when it works. Yeah. <laughs> so I hope you've got your, both your fingers and your toes crossed and we can stay live for, we, we have about 10 minutes to talk through some of the issues that um, you covered. I know you really skimmed on the surface of um, uh, what you're trying to do on your farms. Graham, I might start with you. I mean, I, I was lucky enough to be down on your farm with you about uh, two weeks ago. Uh, it was a lovely day and you took me for a stroll through the place. Um, I, I was struck that, you know, your brother had been farming organically for 20 plus years, but it's taken you, you've gone on a circuitous route, if you like, coming to the organic farming family. Why, why do you think that is? What is the reluctance, what was the reluctance in you or what is the reluctance in, in conventional farmers to embrace organic farming when there is so much of an encouragement, a drive now nationally and at an EU level to get more farmers involved? Well, I suppose I, I was very much, you know, I, I, as a farmer, you look at what's going on above the ground. So you look at what weeds you have, you look at what grass you grow and you look at your, your crops, how they're growing. It was only when I started uh, going to things and they started talking about the soil and the amount of life that was there under the soil that I decided I, that it was something that I had to look into more. So as I looked into more about the soil, um, it just... Uh, just meant I, I couldn't, uh, I, I didn't feel comfortable going on with the way I was going. Like I, I looked at the farm totally differently afterwards. Um, and I think until that happens, you're, you're not going to really change. Like until you kind of change the way you, you look at things, it's, it's, it's not a change you'll take on. All right. And uh, it's obviously one that you're, you're happy with. And when I, again, when I was down talking to you, you said to me, you know, you have more time. It's a less time intensive, even though you're working hard at certain times in the, in the organics. You're probably maybe using your head more so than sitting on a tractor, clocking in the hours on a sprayer. Yeah, well, you would be like that, I suppose. Yeah, there's more, definitely more time spent thinking about things and, and going out and walking the farm, seeing what nature's out there. And it can be very encouraging when you start, start seeing more insects, more life. Um, I'm hoping to see more earthworms coming in, better soil structure. So when I walk the farm now, I bring a spade with me. I dig a hole here and I dig a hole there and see what's going on. And it's a great way to see where you're at and how your farm's performing. Uh, whereas before, I would have just walked around and looked at everything above the soil. This is a question for both of you, but I'll take you first, Graham. Um, are you measuring soil carbon and have you any idea as to whether it's increasing yet in your farm? Um, well, I suppose I've only started making changes, uh, so I wouldn't know whether it's uh, it's increasing just yet. But it's it's, it's something I definitely keep an eye on. I'd be probably focusing on the hedges. Uh, my hedges would have been cut tight before. That was what I wanted, and that's the way I wanted to farm. And now I'm letting them grow. I'm going to let them grow, and I'm hoping to uh, maybe that that'll improve the carbon storing on my farm. For you, a mean, start. you mean you don't have nice tidy hedges anymore? 
Not anymore. No, I've changed my viewpoint. So, <laughs> so they're growing. They're growing out bigger, and I just like you know before I was trying to cut them back and chase in, get a bit, another little bit of ground here and there. Whereas now I see it as a valuable reservoir for my farm. Um, it'll store carbon and it'll uh, be good for beneficials that are on the farm. Uh, Coleman, I bring you in here. Uh, you any idea what way carbon is going under the ground on your farm? Um, the initial baseline study is that we were done on said that a new plot would have across it would have been about 14-15% organic matter which is kind of six six and a half percent solid carbon levels which are relatively high and I remember discussions with Christine Jones here last year on it and one of the factors was comparing how carbon is measured across the world different and different methods and like on international scales that level is very high um, relatively high in a way um, but at the same time there's a lot of work I think we're at early days was the feedback I, I, I took from it we're at early days really in the proper assessment of carbon and soil and how it's stored and how it moves and how it develops and that there are different methodologies and you know the one thing I would have seen I showed it there in the group uh, with the, the speed of the shovel was it's, it's not even the concentration of carbon but it's the depth of carbon it's how far down the carbon goes and I think that's a lot of the story in biological farming and, you know, in farming, in farming is the soil is more than the top three inches and how, 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 we, how, how we look at it maybe at a deeper level. Okay. Um, and I should say that uh, that was a question from Brian Murphy and uh, viewers are uh, encouraged, we're more than happy to take your questions. You can hammer them in there um, on... Uh, email or in the chat. Uh, this is a message from uh, Jack Healy. Um, ha, co I think this is for you, Coleman, more than Graham. Although Graham, maybe this applies to your your sheep enterprise. Have you used mob grazing on your farms, and what's your opinion on this? So, Coleman, maybe you'd um, take the lead on that. Yeah. Um, I first, came across mob grazing through a magazine called The Stockman Grass Farmer through your next speaker, Greg Judy, and a few more of them years and years ago um, and I tried it took a long time for the for the opinion to drop and how this actually works and how it could apply um, sorry for going around about answer I keep it short but it to figure out how you could apply it to Irish farming and to our systems and to my grass wards at home of which are probably right grass with bits of clover and maybe bits of weed grasses in it and I could never really see it working um, I can't see it working without diversity without diversity in both to, to maintain the quality of the sward, that it, it is not heading out to the one time, so that there, there has to be diversity in growth across the seasons, and, and thus the diversity of the quality, to keep the quality of the forage up through the season. So it's a difficult one to manage, I think, on on a baseline of ryegrass. I did try it on a baseline of ryegrass by accident in 2018, in that there was a late turnout in the strong grass, and I said, oh, look, I had to graze something, and I couldn't go and bail it all, and he ended up grazing it, and it worked very well kind of said, oh, should we see how this goes? And it will work very well until about mid-June, when the grass started heading out, and the quality just went hot, as you would imagine. And we just had to go in with the more and reset everything. Um, but there was a penalty there, the milk yields just hit the floor out of a shot. When it had worked well, milk yields were actually up to a point, and then the, the, it, it seeded. And so I have tried it, but there's, I think we have to, to uh, Coleman's link. Say, oh, this is Sorry, Coleman, your link just your link just uh, broke up on us there. You were just finishing oh, up that point there. Give it that to us again. <coughs> oh, he's frozen. Okay, Graham. Um, I just said that, yeah, rather than I just think that if they're the, the technology is kind of with us. Uh, Graham, you look like I can see you blinking, so that means you're yeah, still I'm alive. Still alive yeah. um, so. the, the mob grazing, is that something that applies to sheep at all? Um, it's not something I've done at the moment, but I suppose I'll be looking at longer rotations through pastures and, you know, um, if I, it's something I'd, I'd kind of consider all right, but it's not something I've done at the moment anyway. So. Okay. Uh, Coleman talked a lot about his multi-species sward. Is that something that you're trying to roll out on, on your pasture? Yeah, definitely all right. Yeah, we'll uh, try and get as many plants growing as possible. See what turns up naturally. We'll see what um, 
what we can put in. So chicory, plantain, stuff like that. Like, so I'll, st I'll start introducing them. Anytime I'm reseeding now, I'll be looking at getting as many, many beneficial plants or, you know, something that I can put in extra. Christine Jones the, was, talking, was talking about a 16-way mix earlier. I mean, can you give us a, a bit of an insight into what, how many different species or types of plants you have in your mix? I haven't actually reseeded since since I've started down this road like um, that much. So it's something I'll be looking into in the future. But I suppose I, I would feel I, didn't, I don't have to sow 16 different plants to get 16 plants. I just have to see, you know, there, there will be weeds and herbs and flowers growing okay. in the field as well. So okay. it's about putting enough in there with them to get to something that uh, will enhance the animal life and the plant life and, and the soil life. Coleman, I think you're back with us. Um, it, it, can you give us a, um, a detail on how your multi-species uh, seed mix breaks down? How many different species are in it? And if you have those, I don't know if you, were, you saw Christine Jones's presentation earlier, but she talked about four different groups, grasses, legumes, tall herbs, and short herbs. Yeah, um, again, I started with a basic, without plug and company, but a well-known English company that does organic seed and um, that does uh, and does a lot of promotion of, of herbal lays and mixed species words. So I just used one of their off-the-shelf mixes initially, and you know that would cut in the same as most multi-species mixtures, um, but a mixture of grasses, a mixture of legumes, and mainly a mixture of tall herbs. There wouldn't have been four. So like there would have been a lot of different varieties probably three different groups of plants maybe not the four um but i added a mix to a thin that i got from an irish organic seed company which was just herbs for grasslands and that contained an awful no. a lot of say what you'd call short it's um there has there has been initial establishment and but i think the taller the taller herbs the taller grasses and the clovers have dominated rather than these short little salady kind of plants and herbs but at the same time i don't know how much how much of a species is needed or how much of a population is needed to contribute to this underground diversity the other thing that will occur there are naturally occurring say weeds I and mean, there is the odd um, thistle there is the odd dandelion there is the odd dock um the, the, and the rushes, that, too. the rushes that came in back into your pasture, how do you propose to deal with them? Are they just part of the biodiversity or are you going to try and get rid of them? And how do you get rid of them as an organic farmer? Uh, yeah, selling rushes as biodiversity is a lot, is, 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 is tough sell now. Um, no, um, yeah, rushes are, where they are, they'll die out through mowing. Now, I didn't mow them this year because I was establishing a multi-species ward. And again, very new to the management and very... Uh, aware of, of, of not being too severe and knocking out species too early before they get established but, but mowing is the only way and they are on relatively dry ground and they will die out through mowing i mean they, they're they're thin on the ground they did establish but they're thin they're not forming tussocks okay. down in the lower part of the paddock they are but mowing is yeah fingers crossed that they'll die out on you i want to uh, push through a couple more questions before our time is up uh, gents um a question here from michael devery what reaction, what was the, was the reaction of other farmers in the area to the trials that you've been doing on your land? I mean, maybe I go to you, Graeme, on this one. Um, there's been a bit of interest. They see more clover growing. Uh, you can see things are different over the hedges. I had a few comments during the drought about how much grass I had. So um, the clover seemed to power through on my farm through the drought this year. So um, while being grazed, it still grew on through it. So I was impressed with that. And it was definitely noticed locally anyway. So. Do you get the sense your ears are burning a bit? <laughs> yeah, well, people be always watching. They notice everything you do, all right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it's only natural for farmers to take an interest in what their neighbours are doing, especially if they're also farming. Coleman, I mean, do you see much um, interest in your immediate locality in, in terms of what you're trying to do? Yeah, there is, and it's very positive. It's actually very curious and very supportive. Um, I would have been involved in discussion groups back to the... Uh, a couple of discussion groups and still involved in some and you know so all those people are saying what you're doing how's it going and they're genuinely curious they're interested they see the the development they see the they also see i mean we heard david wallace say earlier and the level of complexity and knowledge there and 
it really they know it all applies to, to to their own farms as well. It's just they're all, they know we're all on a learning curve forever. Okay. Uh, curve together, and they're probably delighted to see a guinea pig in their area, you know. But um, yeah, a lot of very positive reaction from farm walks and farm visits as well to the to the herbal lay and the mixed species swabs. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to look for 10 second answers from you on these last uh, couple of questions. Uh, Dorian Edder uh, asks, I think this is for you, or maybe it's for you, Coleman. Um, are you using a no-till drill to overseed pastures? If not, how is seeding done real quick? I'll take that so first. Um, yeah, I have used uh, just a, a, a stitcher seeder um, to, to, for the trial. For doing that but it hasn't worked for multi-species words yeah okay, okay. so still uh research to be done there kira asks how long does graham leave the fields in the fertility building lay with the sheep um, i think about two years two to three years okay two to three years coleman back to you jack healy asks what biofertilizers have you found useful on your farm um biofertilizers the Again, I, I'm not sure about plug-in products now, to be honest. Yeah. Um, but I really haven't liked about plug-in products. I mean, I've used natural, simple homemade biofertilizers such as compost tea, such as seaweed, or seaweed extract, as can be purchased easily. And um, I also use milk as well, just diluted, very well diluted, maybe one to two hundred. Okay. Um, and yeah. lastly, to you, Graeme, uh, to wrap up this particular part of the day. Um, is your system based on min-till, no-till or plough-based and also does he feel like he's lacking farmyard, uh, farmyard manure, farmyard machinery, farmyard manure with only having sheep? Um, yeah, it would be a bit lacking for farmyard manure with only having sheep but I'd be looking to build, to get a small bit of our farming manure off neighbours and I'd be able to build a stable compost so I wouldn't be applying the high rates of um, farming manure that other people might be doing. Um, and I'm plow based at the moment, but I have access to a no-till drill that I, I do as little as I had to, or as much as I had to, if you know what I mean. So, depending you know, on the year. Yeah, that's it. Depend on the year, depend on the weeds, depend on the grass cover, all these things. You, you, I can't be too dogmatic about what you are. You, you have to do, you have to grow a crop, plain and simple. Yeah. Okay, gentlemen, uh, really appreciate your insights uh, from the ground, from the field, so to speak. That is uh, Graeme Harris and Coleman Dealey, their two recent uh, converts or in-conversions, uh, conversion farms to the organic uh, farming system.